Hello, welcome back to the Ashwan Breakfast Call. And now we're in the dialogue session with Miss Cynthia Gabriel, who is the founder behind a C4 in Malaysia. By C4, we mean Center for Combat, uh, to Combat Corruption and Cronyism in Malaysia. Hi, uh, Cynthia. Hello, good morning. Tell us a little about C4 and yourself. Okay, uh, myself first. My name is Cynthia Gabriel. Uh, I've been a, a human rights activist for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the setting up of the Center to Combat uh, Corruption and Cronyism, although it's a new initiative, has actually a number of very uh, well-profiled um, individuals, uh, those with very um, outstanding track records in civil society movements. The reason why we set up uh, this centre um, has actually a few objectives. First is that in Malaysian civil society, which is very confined and very focused on very specific issues, we find that although the issue of corruption is something that uh, has gained traction over the last couple of years, and especially in the lead up to the last general elections, uh, there isn't uh, an adequate civil society response. Mm. Uh, we have a few groups uh, working on governance issues, including Transparency International Malaysia, but it has not uh, uh, consistently uh, dealt with the issues of corruption the way it should. Uh, the way it deserves to be addressed in the media, the way it deserves to be addressed with civil society and with the general public at large. Mm-hmm. Because this touches the core and the heart of uh, how the government administers itself. It's about public spending. It's about our money. It's about taxpayers' money being mismanaged or being uh, misused or even abused uh, to enrich uh, people in power. And this has been going on for many years. So in the lead up to the last general election, there was a very, very clear uh, outcry from people. First of all, Bursay led a very uh, clear call for a free and fair elections, knowing very well that the election system was completely corrupt, right from the electoral rolls, right up to the way in which campaigns were managed and so on. So... In the larger scheme of things, it was not just the elections that was corrupt. It was the administration that was showing itself to be corrupt after more than 50 years in power. And this, by this I mean that we were getting um, uh, the right, yeah, the people becoming more and more uh, emboldened uh, to actually speak about corruption issues, to actually uh, expose, to name and shame wrongdoers and corrupt offenders. They could have been small corrupt offenders right up to ministers and even the prime minister was implicated in a corruption scandal linked to the purchase of the submarines. So, in short, uh, the reason why C4 was formed uh, after the general elections, there was a lot of work done right after the general elections and people felt that there needed to be a call, a very specific voice uh, to address the worsening corruption situation in the country. So C4 was formed as an inspiration to that. It's a civil society initiative to address corruption issues on uh, various fronts, so which I will elaborate as you as, as you ask me along. questions. Yeah. Right, but I'm just wondering you're talking about corruption a lot, but really how serious is it? Okay. If you ask uh, many people who work on governance issues, who work on human rights issues, corruption has become the primary problem in the country. And I say primary because our country uh, has been running at very serious budget deficits uh, and it has been made known at the last budget exercise as well. So we also know that the government has now placed the burden of rising prices of goods on its own people. Now, this is very much to actually replenish depleting funds and very much to make sure that we don't go bankrupt, to to uh, to be blunt about the whole thing. So corruption is actually so primary that Malaysia has hit the international index and the international news on for all the wrong reasons. We were number three in the survey of the illicit outflow of funds 
And that is really serious. This is after China and uh, Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Um, If I can also add in another index, it's called the Crony Capitalism Index, uh, released by The Economist, and we're number three as well. Yeah, That's That's the latest one that came out. Mm -hmm. And so we are known for Crony Capitalism, which is a really bad form of... uh, 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 administering our economics because it means that we are actually promoting cronyism as part of how the economy functions. Mm -hmm. So then we are also very infamous for illicit outflow of funds, which means that we are a kind of transit country that actually allows a lot of uh, uh, siphoning out of money uh, uh, to go out. Now, what we also know is that many of our ministers and top political leadership have bank accounts overseas. And uh, I will talk about the UN Convention Against Corruption later because this is where the ASEAN and international perspective comes in to fight corruption. But uh, over and above that, there are other surveys and index that continue to place Malaysia on a sliding slope. And it's a very slippery slope because once you start slide down the uh, the uh, road towards poor governance, I think it's going to be very hard to actually um, uh, pick up and actually start administ- administering policies that ensure good governance. So you have also last year uh, the corporate um, accounting firm Ernst and Young. I think they are very well known. They did a survey on a, a bribe payer survey, and they found that Malaysia topped many countries in terms of government receiving bribes from the private sector in order to do business. And this has become so commonplace that in order to secure a contract or to secure a, a an agreement uh, in the public sector, uh, the most common thing to do is to pay a bribe to ensure you get the license or to ensure that you get a contract. So I am also a Pataling Jaya city councillor. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I can tell you that in the public sector, one of the most amazing uh, discoveries is how entrenched uh, the system of corruption is. You can see it. Uh, up front. You can see it in the documents that they give you, but it's so entrenched in how budgets are, are developed. Calculated. Yeah, mm-hmm. and how they've actually allocated like 10% or 8% of it to uh, actually feed themselves. Mm-hmm. And this is all part of a much larger problem because the civil service is not paid mm-hmm. properly and that uh, in the procurement industry, procurement means you, you buy goods on behalf of the government. Um, and uh, this is where many of the public sector staff are so prone to bribery and so prone to actually be uh, involved in um, selective kind of um, relationship which is becomes very comfortable i was i was just wondering so what about like within states between states which states that you uh it is more corrupted than the other you mean within malaysia within malaysia um i think there has not been a very uh, scientific study but front and offhand, you can already see that several chief ministers have hit the headlines very clearly. And it becomes really frustrating for ordinary people like us. Uh, in the case of uh, Taib Mahmud, for example, the Sarawak chief minister, uh, who has more than 40 cases uh, in the MECC on alleged corruption. But the MECC has been unable to find him guilty of any act of corruption. I'll tell you why. Because he's so clever. He's actually enriched his family empire uh, so large. It's become a major uh, business conglomerate around the world. Mm -hmm. But his name is usually not directly implicated in the contract because he's the chief minister. And as chief minister, I think you can't be part of all these uh, side consultancy agreements and all that. So you have his sons, his daughters, his uncle, his cousins, the works. And if you remember, there was a video produced by Global Witness. This is mm-hmm. a group uh, yeah, yeah, uh, based in London. Uh, they actually went in as... Um, uh, Yes, that's right. And they found that uh, this is how it actually worked between the uh, the developers of the land and the state government, where you just need to um, sign off, give them licenses at a shortcut way, and so on and so forth. But the point is that Taib Mahmud is now being um, rewarded for 
everything that he has done, and he is now the governor of Sarawak. So this this has become very frustrating for the ordinary people. Is MECC able to nab him for any of the corruption crimes that he has committed? Because under the UN Convention Against Corruption, there is a very, very specific um, area the the convention actually is very comprehensive. It has five major um, topics, mm-hmm. but the last one is on asset recovery. Mm-hmm. Asset recovery means if you lost money, mm-hmm. let's say in the case of the uh, National Feedlot Corporation, that was another mm-hmm. famous one, the Lumbu, uh, Lumbu in a condo cow. case. Yeah. Yes, the cow. Sorry, English. The cow in a condo case. <laughs> uh, so in in this case, um, we lost. RM 250 million. It was a soft loan given to the husband of a, a minister. And the fact is that money was actually misused to purchase uh, luxury condominiums and open up supermarkets and restaurants and so on and so forth. Now the money is lost. And whose money is that? Mm. It's ours. Just wondering, like, in terms of uh, maybe for the past five years or the past few years that uh, maybe C4 has been monitoring, how much money we have lost since due to well, corruption? Yeah. it's hard to quantify like that because you find that more and more corruption scandals need to be highlighted and exposed before you can quantify them. And a lot more have not. But if you look at some of the big cases, they run into billions and billions of ringgit. Uh, and so it's, it's actually very serious, but how you quantify whether that money is, um, actual bribes or actual corruption is actually something that has not been tabulated in that sense. But just, uh, just that point about asset recovery, because Malaysia is a signatory to the convention and Malaysia mm. does not sign many international conventions but during the time of Prime Minister Abdullah Badawi mm-hmm. he actually um, uh, believed I think in uh, addressing the issue of corruption quite seriously so he did two things he elevated the anti-corruption agency to become MACC with more power mm-hmm. but apparently not enough power because they still cannot prosecute uh, corrupt offenders and so on but the most important thing is that he uh, he ensured that Malaysia became a signatory to the UNCAC and so Asset recovery now becomes something which is very possible. So in terms of bank accounts overseas and all that, um, if Taib Mahmoud had a bank account in Switzerland, which we know that he has, and a bank account in Canada and in Australia, you can actually use the convention to reclaim back uh, the funds in cooperation with the countries where the bank accounts actually reside. But that kind of international cooperation is complicated. It needs the cooperation of the country on uh, the other side and the country on Malaysia. But the problem is always the political will on this side. It's their political will. Now, I'm not going to answer it, but I'm going to ask the question on this radio station because I, uh, is there feedback from people? No. Um, yeah, uh, if, if there is, uh, they will leave comments on Facebook and okay. I'll read it out for okay. you. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, so you were asking about numbers just now. I think it's a bit difficult to quantify the loss because I can tell you that in the Scorpion submarine scandal, the one that <coughs> I was the whistleblower uh, in Swaram, mm-hmm. um, that one is running into the the focus of the French inquiry, which is ongoing now, is half a billion ringgit. 500 million ringgit. Mm. And that can actually build how many schools and hospitals? You tell me. <laughs> Okay, yeah. but that went to this middle company called Perimeca for something called training and coordination services. And we still have no idea how that money was used. Maybe some money was used to train the naval uh, officers to run the submarine, but it definitely does not run into 500 million. And the French officials can tell you that based on how they sold submarines to Pakistan and India. It doesn't cost that much. I was, I was, I'm also wondering, like, when it comes to the history of corruption in Malaysia, when does it start to become a cancer? Hmm. Okay, as I was saying just now, I think you are right because the history of corruption in Malaysia is actually quite long-standing. Mm-hmm. It has been there since mm-hmm. 
our independence or even before that. But the concerns have actually risen in the last couple of years uh, and it has become more public mm. so even if it was there people just accepted it as part of cu- the culture mm-hmm. of uh, when you go and do your passport or when you lose your IC or when the policeman stops you for mm-hmm. beating a red light What what's the first thing that you do? You might want to bribe him to avoid a summons mm-hmm. Because that is a very normal culture. But what we are focusing on at C4 and many of the anti-corruption groups here is about mismanagement of public funds. How the government in power, whom we voted into power, has actually abused and misused uh, public funds um, in a very serious way. So that issue now has become more public. And I'll tell you what. When it has become more public mm-hmm. was after 2008, I when I believe uh, things changed very dramatically with our political landscape. Mm-hmm. How did it change? The opposition won a few uh, key economic states in the country mm-hmm. on the Western Belt. From Penang, they won Perak in 2008 and then they lost it. And then uh, they also won Salango, which is the jewel in the crown for mm-hmm. Malaysia's uh, investment and economics. And, uh, of course, Kelantan on the other side. But the point really being that uh, now that the opposition was controlling the economic belt of the country, uh, there was a lot more debate in parliament about asking questions on accountability. And this was never the culture of the Malaysian government. They could get away scot-free before. They didn't have to answer anything. Mm -hmm. But now the voice in parliament was much bigger. And um, there were questions at the Parliamentary Accounts Committee, uh, questions raised in parliament. And you know MPs like Tony Poa and Rafizi Ramli, they focus on issues of governance. Mm -hmm. So they keep Bringing it up. And then the alternative media and social media plays another big part because they report it. Mm -hmm. And when they report it, then the mainstream media is forced to respond respond or also report it in a way that is, of course... Uh, skewed in a a direction. Every year, we always look forward to the AG report, Anthony General report, and that's that's where we can... uh, That's right. So that's the other thing. The Auditor General, although he has been reporting to Parliament for a long time, uh, has not actually picked up uh, that kind of attention as before. So Mm -hmm. what does that tell you about why C4 is inspired to set up an organization like this is mm-hmm. because now people are questioning the contents of the AG report. Mm-hmm. The AG report has actually stated maladministration for the longest time. But now you have things like uh, clocks mm-hmm. costing, running into millions of ringgit. Yeah, uh, the infamous uh, case of the sports minister back then of selling um, um uh, sports merchandise at a much higher cost than the usual. Absolutely. And this is the cost. problem of procurement that mm-hmm. I was speaking about uh, earlier. Because in the government sector, even if you want to buy a glass, which you can go to IKEA or any store and buy this at one ringgit per glass, uh, in the public sector, because of the whole dynamics of procurement, the middle agencies that are involved and the certain companies that can actually... Uh, tender for such things, the glass will cost you five ringgit Mm -hmm. instead of one ringgit. And then you wonder what really has gone wrong with our procurement Mm -hmm. process and where does that excess money go Mm -hmm. to? So this is really where the AG comes in because Mm -hmm. he does random audits. And this Mm -hmm. is a very important point. He can't go to every department. Uh, He does random audits. But just by random audits, he picks up a lot of very serious issues. And you know that the problem is so entrenched. In the PJ City Council itself, uh, since we went in 2008, uh, there are some things that uh, the Pakatan Rakyat government have done uh, which must be credited because it's in the right direction of good governance. There's a lot more that they need to improve. But the one thing that they did set up is uh, something called the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee, which is uh, like an oversight mechanism. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are also helping uh, state governments, as you asked just now the Mm -hmm. question of states, 
state governments to start applying and introducing independent oversight mechanisms. Is it only in Selangor or is it in all In Pakistan? Selangor and Penang, it's a little bit less complicated because they have the Freedom of Information enactment already. Mm-hmm. Why is... Am I jumping? Am I going everywhere? It's oh, okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, because Freedom of Information is one of the key tools to combat corruption, you need to break the culture of secrecy in government. So mm-hmm. the, you foster open government policies and then mm-hmm. you can combat corruption. So that's what we are about. So we work with MECC, we work with all this uh, uh, Pemandu and Paul Lau's ministry and all that. But at the same time, we remain critical watchdogs of how um, governance is admin- administrated in this country. So for Selangor and Penang, because they have the Freedom of Information Act, uh, enactment, sorry, we can actually push for test cases uh, to be to be um, uh, tried out, and that's going to be very interesting, because in fact the first thing that we did try was the uh, urging the Selangor Menteri Besar to declassify the controversial water deal, mm. the water deal between Selangor and the federal government, mm. uh, where Selangor is buying back the assets and the uh, water management from the concessionaires and all that. Mm -hmm. So that is now declassified. And part of our job is actually to ensure citizenship participation and uh, bringing them into the core of how government decision-making is made. So um, to make myself more clear, what I mean is that citizens should have a bigger say in how governments make their decisions. And one of the ways they can do that is to gain government documents which are supposedly secret via the FOI. Right. Maybe what we can do now is to to extract from some case examples and also to extract then what could be some recommendations of how we could combat corruption in those cases. Yeah. So, like... Um, okay, let me let me start with the water deal because the water deal has been quite difficult to follow because it's got all these different uh, opinions, arguments, and I think in short, it's about uh, during the era of Prime Minister uh, Mahathir, water, which is a very basic basic infrastructure for us, was privatized, and it was privatized throughout the country, but in Selangor, there were four private companies who manage water. But when Selangor was won by the opposition, then they realized that there was one way to make the life of the government very difficult, which is to interrupt water supply. I don't know how many of your houses actually suffered this uh, water rationing. And Me? Yeah? <laughs> yeah <we all> okay. <laughs> which is actually... Not supposed to be the case mm-hmm. because sometimes they close the dams and they say, oh, it's got too much high levels of ammonia. There was an oil spill. And then so your water supply gets disrupted, which means the water concessionaires are not being very um, uh, efficient about their tasks. But all this started to come about only after 2008. So you find that it's actually become a political issue because what Slango wanted to do was to bring it back to the responsibility of the government. So in short, it was bought back, but there were many questions about how much it cost to buy it back and whether there was anybody benefiting from that exercise or not and whether the Menteri Basar was really doing it in the interest of the people. The chief minister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry. So uh, this is where... Um, the issue of governance came in because there there is no allegation of corruption, but there is an issue of good governance involved. And the only way people will know if there was a good decision made is if he declassified the memorandum of understanding. Mm-hmm. So with all that pressure from C4 and the media and the people within his own political uh, coalition, uh, he has uh, made a statement that the document has been declassified. Okay, now more uh, concrete examples will be, are you familiar with CELCAT for Um, Selangor? It's the Select Committee on Competency, Mm -hmm. Accountability and Transparency, which the Selangor Speaker chairs, which is now Hana Yo. 
Now, she just conducted an inquiry on the PKNS issue where Azmin Ali as a bot, one of the bots right? was sacked. Yeah. And so why was he sacked? Was there an issue of uh, uh, corruption? Yeah, or cronyism mm. or uh, people wanting to place their own people, etc. But the point here is that she conducted an open inquiry, mm. open to the media, so that all the questions and even the military Basar and Azmin Ali were summoned. So these mm. are actually practices of good governance. Mm. So one of the things C4 is trying to do is to ensure that we move to higher levels to actually have an ombudsman for mm. good governance in Selangor and Penang. In the other states which are administered by Barisan National, of course it becomes a little bit more complicated. But we do that via the MACC. So those are for state level and local mm. government practices and administration. But for the bigger national scandals, uh, I mentioned the National Feedlot Corporation. Mm. The whistleblower is now in court. Mm. So it's very dangerous business to... Uh, expose corruption in this mm-hmm. country. So one of the first things to fight corruption in Malaysia and at the ASEAN level is to try to promote the culture of whistleblowing mm-hmm. and to promote whistleblower protection because... Currently, do we have a whistleblower protection? We have now a whistleblower protection act. But the irony of it is that the whistleblower protection act doesn't actually prom- protect the whistleblowers. What you need to do is you need to complain directly to MACC and then you cannot go and speak to the press and you cannot highlight your co- your concerns anywhere else. But I tell you, um, that doesn't work because C4 also tried to... Uh, we, we did lodge a, a specific complaint on type or over a waste management deal that uh, we worked together with Global Witness. So there was very concrete details of... Um, uh, consultancy agreement of 6.6 million ringgit uh, siphoned off to his son, uh, Bakir. Uh, but MECC has not re- come back to us. So we went to the press. So the minute you go to the media, it means you lose your protection, mm. uh, which is really mm. crazy because in you you need to build the debate and the discussion on corruption in order to, to uh, put pressure on the government to do something. So this is part of the advocacy that's needed. And then in the case of Scorpion, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Swaram had a few closed door discussions with MACC on this, but because it didn't really move. So we went to the press and we even went further by taking up a, uh, an inquiry in France, something that we did not know will, will take shape into a full-fledged inquiry that has now uh, threatened the um, uh, credibility of the Najib administration because he was the defense minister that signed the contract at that time. Mm-hmm. So the the whistleblower in the case of Swaram, we were harassed to death and almost got deregistered because of the fact that we highlighted a corruption scandal. So that's why I tell you, in in government... Uh, the issue of corruption is so core that they prefer less people talk about it. Mm. More people debate and discuss, it means they are under scrutiny. Mm. And the same goes for ASEAN because this is why you find that uh, for, say, women empowerment, youth empowerment, they are willing to go a certain distance to bring people together. But when it comes to governance issues, to transparency, to accountability, you're actually hitting the core of their administration because they are forced to be accountable to the people. And it's back to people are the bosses concept. Mm -hmm. You tell me what's happened to my money and uh, how it's being administered. So in Thailand, I believe one of the rallying calls for Ying Lak to step down is that she is colonial. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is purportedly corrupt. Mm -hmm. But is that true? Is that not true? So this is why you need the public institutions to work for the people. They need to be impartial and they need to be independent. And here is where we have the problem of uh, MECC uh, needing to strengthen itself. It needs to actually um, show that it can uh, nab the corrupt offenders. One question about the MACC. It seems like 
every cases related to corruption or wrongdoings, we always have to go back to N MACC to the extent that seems like there's no other way forward. But in your opinion, do you think that we should have a better model at uh, combating corruption? Oh, definitely. Uh, but the first point to note is that MACC is the primary body in the country to combat corruption. So, Based on your question, am I correct to assume that you're saying that MECC is not adequate? Is that um, what you're asking? Yeah, it seems like in every uh, corruption issues, people put the blame on MECC and it seems that MECC is right. not moving forward in terms of solving the cases. Right. So, mm. MECC is the primary body. There is no uh, bigger. So, the f the reality is the mounting frustration of the people because, as I mentioned to you, the, the latest uh, fiasco was the escalation of type 2 governor position without a single uh, inquiry or accountability uh, question by p the political leadership on his governance in the last 30 plus years. Now, MACC has actually a lot of powers to take on corrupt offenders. Mm. They must do several things in terms of recommendation. They must improve their investigation methods. So if, for example, we are not able to find the Sarawak chief minister guilty of a corrupt practice because, or whatever, that his name is not there, then do we stop there? Or do we know that there are other ways in which we can improve investigation methods? The other case was PKFZ, the Port Klang Free Trade Zone. Yep. We lost 12.5 billion ringgit. It's billion, not million. I don't know how many zeros there are in billion. <laughs> Nine, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but we lost that money. And then we found that the court acquitted the two transport ministers, Ling Leong Sik and Chan Kong Choi, in that. Uh, so the question that you and I ask is, what happened to that money? Where did it go if these two guys were acquitted? Mm -hmm. Because the reason they were acquitted is our former Prime Minister Mahathir said that he was not misled in the briefings in cabinet and so on. So now the ordinary people like you and I will say, okay, if MACC is unable to nab who were the offenders in the PKFZ case, and who were the of offenders in some of the Sarawak clear land grab corruption cases and so on? Then who do we depend on if it's not MECC? Mm -hmm. But in the context of our discussions with them, because ever since C4 was formed, we have had more constructive discussions with them on how to take the, the fight against corruption forward. Mm -hmm. We found that uh, one of the most important things is to strengthen MECC via law reform, via their MECC Act and legislative mandate. And the question now is, was it deliberate that MECC was given only so much powers but still restricted? And should they expand their powers or not? So MECC uh, Chief Commissioner, he is actually a very uh, um, open, constructive guy. He has met many of the policy makers from the leader uh, BN and the Pakatan Rakyat to bring up debates in parliament to change the MECC law. One of it was to make it an independent legal service commission like mm. Suhaka. Mm. So which means it does not comprise of civil servants that feel that they need to be subservient to a political leadership. So the first principle is to be impartial. Mm. Second principle is to strengthen prosecution powers because MECC, we found out, conducted a good investigation on PKFZ. Mm. They passed it to the uh, Attorney General because he's the only one that can uh, prosecute uh, individuals. But he uh, did not take their recommendations fully. Is it uh, obliged for them to take their recommendations? No, the AG will study the investigation papers mm -hmm. and then he will decide whether to press charges on the individual. Mm -hmm. Because when he press charges on the individual, it means mm -hmm. then it goes to court. Mm -hmm. And if it goes to court, it means he needs to now build a case to uh, uh, ensure that he wins mm -hmm. 
against the individual because then the government is actually taking uh, someone to court because he con- he conducted a corrupt act. So many a time the uh, AG uh, office is part of the difficulty in the problem in combating corruption. I'll give you another example um, and uh, just tell me to slow down if it's too many examples. Um, yeah, maybe we'll provide another example after the break. Hello, welcome back to the ASEAN Breakfast Call. And again, we have Cynthia Gabriel from C4 with us in Malaysia broadcasting live. So we're talking about uh, corruption just now. And I, I, I was personally very curious um, about the point that Cynthia brought up in one of uh, uh, our discussion just now. She mentioned about this is a very dangerous thing to pursue. Um, and I, I believe that uh, as, as with any whistleblower in other country, there are great risks that uh, a whistleblower faces. But what is the situation in Malaysia? Well, as I mentioned just now, this is the crux of the challenge uh, to actually build a collective fight against corruption. We need every person to be what you call a citizen journalist. Mm-hmm. So if you see a corrupt practice taking place, it's really important to report it and not keep quiet about it. But when you report it, you put yourself at risk. Now, I myself have been at great risk after blowing the whistle on the Scorpion corruption scandal. Of course, that is like a corruption scandal of very high proportions because it involves um, people in high office mm. <clears throat> right up to the prime minister. So many people have asked me, are you crazy? Why are you doing this? Uh, your life's at risk. You know, you should get a bodyguard and so on and so forth. Now, as much as I know that it is a real risk and as much as there is real fear as there is with everyone else, <coughs> the need to, to expose a corrupt wrongdoer is so important. I mentioned just now the need to protect whistleblowers. We have seen in two or three or even more cases that when you blow the whistle, normally in this country and in many countries around us, it is not the complaint that is investigated, but it is the complainant that is investigated. Shoot the messengers. Yeah, you shoot the messenger instead of going after the message and verifying if the message is uh, uh, legitimate. So this is the problem. And uh, as long as this culture is there, and I think it's deliberate that this culture is there, is to create fear among people. And as long as this message is there, uh, it is almost impossible to expect people to speak up. Now, social media has been a great uh, avenue for for people to say things uh, and hope that they don't get convicted as a result of that. But what we do need to change is uh, political will on the part of the government to promote whistleblower protection. So we are also uh, very much engaged in discussions with the state governments and with the federal governments to do this. And MECC to lead the way to uh, promote whistleblower protection. So yes, we do have the Whistleblower Protection Act. Yeah, I should add that this is very important because for every, let's say, common citizen, this is probably one of their uh, main questions that they have in mind. If I do know something, and if I do want to whistleblow, but but yet, you know, what kind of protections do I have? Yeah, that's so, right. Hmm. So MECC will say that come and report to us. We will protect you because your identity will be completely protected and it's confidential. But Sometimes the frustration is that the complaint is not being acted on or it's too slow or you don't get enough information and feedback on what's happening. And so you decide to go to other agencies to report or even to the media. Uh, but as far as we are concerned, as advocates to fight corruption, that should not uh, negate or create a loss of your protection because you still should be protected by law as a whistleblower. Uh, but the problem here is that we need to reconcile some of the loopholes in the Act that actually does not seek the protection of whistleblowers. So you're absolutely right. If you want citizens to participate in the war against corruption, and I use the word war because I think the scourge is becoming really uh, so big that you need to actually have a collective fight against corruption. One of the first things you need to do 
is to protect the whistleblower. Mm. So whether it's a simple thing, like you saw uh, someone bribe a policeman, uh, do you take a picture and you send it to MECC or you send it to C4? The, that culture needs to change. That culture needs to change. And now I think as much as we know something is gone wrong, we normally don't say anything, especially if it relates to our colleague or to our friend. Uh, we know we won't do it. Uh, and more, more if it, our job is on the line. And if we have children and we are married, we certainly don't want to uh, risk the livelihoods of our family members. So absolutely right. The protection of whistleblowers is of primary uh, concern. Mm. And so it's only after that that you can actually talk about trying to access information, trying to actually uh, name and shame and so on and so forth. So the role of MECC, the role of Pamandu and the uh, uh, ministry created by Najib to look at governance issues and so on. Um, uh, we we put the challenge before them now. They actually have to start developing measures on this. And as civil society organizations, we will definitely move towards conducting more trainings and more, um, uh, what you call that, or workshops and seminars on the need to fight corruption and why and how the Whistleblower Protection Act needs to be further strengthened. Mm. This is to add on to the lobbying efforts that you guys are already doing. But well, let's say I'm just a, a citizen and I know something, let's say. What, who should I go to? Should I go to MACC first or to you guys? Well, there's two, there's more channels now. Of course, MACC is the official channel. It's a statutory body. It's supposed right. to look after your complaint mm. and it will tell you your complaint is being addressed, etc. But normally the frustration is it takes very long before they come back to you or they don't mm-hmm. at all. Uh, the coming to us is actually like an alternative channel right? Uh, because what it does mean is that we do have uh, capacities to investigate certain things, not everything because we don't have uh, enough staff and so on. But we do have capacity to investigate certain things. And then if we investigate faster than MECC, then you can actually use the media and all that to highlight your concern and you put MECC in a more urgent spot to but what, respond. But what's the argument against, you know, you, you not uh, supposed to t- take it to the media and if you do, it, you lose your protection? Well, the first thing is that MECC, which is understandable, they say that they don't want to be caught by the element of surprise, which means they don't want to find out through the media hmm. that something has happened and then you expect them to protect you. But my point is that, fine, we lodge a report with them, but that does not stop us from talking to the media after that mm-hmm. or to anyone else after that because it's not exclusive to MECC. I mean, you have a, a complaint, so you lodge it with MECC. So they already know. So there's no more element of surprise. But the point is now you're building a, a case around your case. You're building the advocacy to show how important your case is. Uh, you can do it anonymously. Now, the, the interesting thing about a complaint, and also because our website is now being developed to have a complaints mechanism, the identity of the complainant is protected. So uh, another person can't see that uh, you have made the complaint, mm-hmm. but only we can see that you may have made the complaint. But we mm-hmm. must make sure it's as hack-proof as possible to ensure that there's only so much in terms of uh, protection that can be accorded and we will give you that much protection. But point really is that the more avenues there are to lodge cor- uh, complaints on corruption, same with human rights violations, the more avenues there are, the better it will be to promote mm-hmm. uh, uh, MACC's uh, uh, more efficient action to solve a problem. Mm-hmm. Moving on uh, to a more uh, broad perspective right sure. so how um, how is Malaysia in comparison to the ASEAN countries um, and also the question on how can the international community be of support to the corruption issues okay hmm. uh, this is interesting because normally the fight against corruption is not domestic mm-hmm. you have ministers and all these big businessmen usually have accounts outside the country Either it's because of the banking system or it's safer to keep their money somewhere else. So the fight against corruption is global. 
And because we are ASEAN, and ASEAN now has an ASEAN Charter on Human Rights, they have an ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, but there isn't a mechanism to fight corruption. And it's about time that it happens because several countries in ASEAN have already signed the UN Convention Against Corruption, including Malaysia, as I mentioned just now. So although Malaysia fares uh, in the middle compared to some of the ASEAN countries, we find that in countries like Indonesia, ever since they democratized, we find that they have actually made tremendous strides and progress in fighting corruption in government, in the public sector, and in terms of citizenship empowerment. So they are at a far better stage than Malaysia. It's just that their country is very hard to administer because it's thousands of islands everywhere. So it's very decentralized. But their anti-corruption commission, which is called KAPIKA, KPK, uh, is actually very, very effective. They only have 800 staff. MECC has 5,000 staff. So 800 staff for a population of 200 million and 5,000 staff for a population of 28 million. So it mm-hmm. tells you uh, that although Indonesia wants to limit the work of anti-corruption, they have actually made many strides by putting in place an ombudsman's office for good governance for example, to work together with Kapika. So which means that, back to your question just now, it's not just about one agency, but you can actually divide the the roles of the different tasks. Uh, to so I guess this is the way forward for the MACC or any Malaysian uh, corruption agency to redefine themselves. Yes, that's mm-hmm. right. So I think it's time for that also to look at uh, why you need an ombudsman's office. An ombudsman's office will be very specific towards targeting, uh, say, uh, good governance in the public sector. So they only focus on that because MECC is like so wide. They also have to look at private sector corruption and so on. So these are ways forward and recommendations forward. But back to the global picture, uh, there is a very, very uh, concrete initiative called the Open Government Partnership. Now, interesting because this is a partnership of governments and the commitment is to promote accountability, transparency and uh, transparency and um, uh, open, open policies in government. Now, Malaysia is not a member. So one of our advocacies must be in that direction to make them a member. Indonesia is the chair this year. Uh, and that tells you the commitment of Indonesia in in taking this 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 issue on, last year it was the UK, so they they take turns and they start developing debates and discourse and all that. And now the membership from eight has grown to about 162 or something. So um, Indonesia is the chair this year, and that for me brings a tremendous opportunity for ASEAN to take this on as a issue within ASEAN government, a regional because agenda. Indonesia is leading it. Mm. And uh, the summit is sometime in September in Bali. Uh, but before that, there is a lead-up of civil society action and all that. So similar to um, ASEAN People's Forum and the Aisha and, and so on. But it's very new. So you're actually creating a new will to churn the mm-hmm. issue of uh, government accountability in ASEAN. And I believe that um, radio channels like yourself and social media must play a big part in actually pushing this forward. Mm-hmm. So I have, uh, uh, I'm enthusiastic that Indonesia is taking the lead uh, for this. And it can be a very valuable opportunity for other governments mm-hmm. to start coming on board. Yeah, in fact, uh, we noted that how uh, in Indonesia, it seems like it's almost a national agenda to combat corruption. Yeah, in fact, you know, agenda. what all the websites would or, or sometimes also mm-hmm. have a blurb on, you know, anti-corruption mm-hmm. and whatnot. So I think that um, it's a positive development. I'm wondering, though, uh, is Malaysia one of those um, in, in, in the partnership that you were talking about? No, they are not. So that's why one of our Even, advocacies has to be right. to make them a member. Even 162 other countries are already. Yes. So we're the remaining 20 or not. <laughs> yeah, that, the yeah. So that aside. What um, does that say? Yeah, what does that say? It's really, I think the final point is really about political will because that is the key ingredient to ensure that uh, we build a collective fight against corruption.
Mm. Uh, any last message? To uh, all that the was listeners. the last message. All we right. need to strengthen that that will. Uh, and the people, the citizens of Malaysia, have a really tremendous role to play in this. Because C4 on its own will not be able to do it. C4 with the help of all Malaysians from all mm-hmm. sectors, especially uh, mm-hmm. rural populations as well. Right. So if I'm an individual who is very supportive of anti-corruption exercise, how can I join uh, and support you guys? Mm. Well, there are many programs and campaigns. We are not a membership-based organization. Right? So uh, there's lots of volunteer groups already forming themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot of energy around us. But also because we're taking time to build our base, establish and uh, get into constructive engagement. I think in the coming months, you will find that there will be a lot more people-friendly activities and uh, especially if you live in Petaling Jaya, for sure, because we are using that as a test case to uh, look at uh, more residents' participation in decision-making of government and so on. Mm, all right, we'll have to thank uh, Cynthia for being with us today. I think thank it was you. a really like energetic field. Uh, Very informative. Yeah, yeah ab- about corruption and whatnot. I, I really do think that it's uh, the heart um, of good governance and without uh, solving corruption issues, there cannot be true progress in a country. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.